just in general in Nashville, there's this, uh, there's just this respect. Like you go to shows here and everyone is so polished. Everyone's a good musician. Even if I don't love their band, I like respect what they're doing and I see that they're good players. I've never truly seen a bad band in Nashville. And so I think because there is this like really great, like, a healthy competition and like everyone respects each other in these like various scenes there is like a cross-pollination of genre and it's like I've seen lineups where it's like an electronic artist with like a surf rock band and then like a hardcore band and like no one blinks an eye about it right now you're hearing from Olivia Ladd after Olivia had the realization at 16 that she should be a music journalist. Her dad took her to check out schools in and around Nashville, and she ended up at MTSU, uh, which is Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, she eventually became, you guessed it, a music journalist. And she currently hosts Band Splainer, um, which is a podcast on this very network, We Own This Town, uh, in which she talks with other musicians, journalists, and friends about the history of their favorite cult bands, Olivia also writes for The Boot, Luck Journal, and Nashville Scene. I found her by way of her writing in Nashville Scene. And uh, she also works in a podcast for WSM 650, which is for the uninitiated, a country channel, sure, uh, but it's also the radio home of the Opry and a foundation of Nashville's musical history and legacy. Oh, and by the way, I am Alex Steed, and this is Nashville Demystified. In each episode, I talk with someone who hasn't been here for all that long about a subject I'm hoping to look into further. And then I talk with someone who's been here longer and is uh, arguably an expert in that subject. Natural Demystified is presented by Knack Factory and We Own This Town. I asked Olivia to come on and explain who John Hartford is. Oh, who is John Hartford? Um, I would say he's like a... I guess it's it's kind of hard to put in a sentence. I mean, he's just like this ace songwriter. He's like a aficionado of kind of 60s songwriting, um, as well as this just like amazing bluegrass player. He was just, I think, to in my opinion, one of the best bluegrass musicians to ever grace Nashville. He was from St. Louis, and then he moved to Nashville, Los Angeles for a bit, but he settled in Madison, Tennessee, which is... Um, kind of, I guess, east, farther east than East Nashville, very close to where I live. And he had a house overlooking the Cumberland River where he would, like, write his music and watch riverboats go by. Um, so he's very much rooted, I think, in in maybe even a new the new Nashville culture before it was here, kind of, because he was taking advantage of this really cool little corner of Nashville that no one else was at the time, I think. Well, I think he's a great example of like of the maybe cool country of Nashville or whatever, because people uh, that that's kind of one of my pet peeves is people, especially working in country and being someone who's like in other music scenes and punk rock or whatever. People are so quick to judge and be like, oh, Nashville is like bro country and the Jason Aldean bar or whatever. And like. I like that stuff, but still, people assume that's all there is, so I think uh, John Hartford is this great example of kind of, he wasn't even an outsider, I would say, he played on Hee Haw, he played with people from the Opry and all that stuff, but he is a really great example of just, like, this pure raw talent that kind of harnessed the, like, the resources available in Nashville and of country music to, like, build a career, and I think people can still do that today, so I think he he's a really cool example of... Um, taking, like, Appalachian influences or how he was obsessed with the Mississippi River or you can really take any interest you have and fit it into the box of country and find your own place. I love that. I absolutely love that. 
This show is basically about the current events in history I'm eager to learn about as someone who is new to this town. It is greedily my excuse to reach out to folks who have interesting histories and stories about interesting people and places. It is important for me to kick off with Hartford because he is a giant. Surprisingly few people know by name, especially folks who are new to the city and the scene. The people who do know his name revere him for good reason. Uh, He helped to launch the new grass scene and movement, which we go into in our last episode. And he was in his time here, respected by musicians old school and new for his contribution to both scenes. That big stern wheeler coming up the creek Make my eyes start to water and my knees get weak That old big whistle when it starts to blow Says, come on, it's time to go Oh, well, I want to be planted when I die Where I can see steamboats paddling by Cause all I ever wanted since ten years old Was to pick and ride an old boat Now see that pilot at the wheel I shave in shoals on 12 inch keel I hope someday that he'll be me on the MISIP Last week we talked with Matt Combs, the celebrated, respected, and award-winning fiddler and mandolinist who moved to Nashville in the 90s and became close with Hartford. Today I talk with Katie Hartford Hogue, Hartford's daughter. She talks about the musician from a much different perspective. I can't thank Katie enough for having me into her home to talk about her dad and the process of getting to know him better towards the end of his life and the process of sorting through his archive. I greatly appreciated Katie's candor and accessibility in this conversation because I can relate to having a father born in the 30s. Uh, Mine was born in 31 and I'm 35 now, so he's a bit of an old dad. Uh, And I could relate to the idea of getting to know a parent largely after they died. Um, It also resonated because her relationship with Hartford was complicated. Now, Matt mentioned it in his interview, and Katie touches upon it here, but Hartford was so intensely dedicated to his craft and career that he had trouble connecting as a parent for years. And it wasn't until closer to the end of his life in the 90s that they began to develop a relationship. In fact, when the question came up about who would organize and sort his archives, Katie didn't really want to take the responsibility on it first. Her husband, anticipating she would want to eventually, took on the task, he remains involved. But for the first while, she describes herself as not particularly enthusiastic about it. But as you'll hear, in warming to the process, and eventually diving into what would be a process that lasted nearly a decade and a half, she had the opportunity to get close to the father she hadn't known especially well for the bulk of his career. Please subscribe to the podcast wherever you can, considering giving it a review if you can, or sharing it with a friend. We're on Instagram at Nashville Demystified, on Twitter at NDemystified, and we are on that festering wound that is Facebook. Uh, if we could have a profile on Friendster, we would, but it is not 2003. If you have any feedback you want to send uh, to me directly or ideas for future shows, you can reach me at podcasts at NAC dash factory.com uh, it's podcast at knack hyphen factory.com that is k-n-a-c-k dash factory.com and one final quick note um i thought we didn't have access to hartford's tunes during the last go but i was wrong katie heard the first episode and let me know which songs the family has access to so you are actually hearing hartford in this episode Check out the episode description on the website to find out which ones we use. Uh, There'll also be a transcript there and other odds and ends. Okay, enough of me. Let's, uh, Let's get to Katie. Uh, My name is Katie Hogue, and um, I guess we're here talking about my dad, who is John Hartford, who was a bluegrass musician, banjo and fiddle player, songwriter here in Nashville. And 
I'm here to answer whatever questions you got. <laughs> so you, you, I'd love to start with the book. Can you mm-hmm. just talk about how that came about and and what you were trying to accomplish by doing that? So uh, dad passed away a little less than 18 years ago. And about 12 years ago, um, when things, you know, the dust had settled and there was a huge storage facility full of his personal things, his office. He kept an office at his house. That was his space, his creative space. And he had it set up um, for maximum creativity the way he wanted things. And when we received that, it was all in boxes. It had been packed up and put into storage. Um, And when we received it, it was just hundreds of boxes and and things from from his his personal office and so we started fortunately we had um, a home with a finished out basement that we could put it all in and it took up most of that room and we just started sorting through it and it was really hard at first um, kind of reliving some things and just just the memories kind of were really flooding back at that point but as we were going through the boxes we kept noticing these journals, these spiral bound music notebooks. Sometimes they were, um, the larger kinds, sometimes they were smaller, but they, they had numbers on them on the outside. And so we would just put these journals in a pile and kind of set them off to the side, trying to figure out what this is. And, and as we're looking through them, you know, he's written music and notation in there. After a while, we realized there were 68 of these notebooks. Um, I think we might have been missing one or two. I think there are a couple out there that we've never located, but in total there were 68 of these journals and they were fiddle tunes and they were all handwritten. They were, um, mostly in pencil. He would use that beautiful calligraphy for the title. And then on every tune he wrote where he was and what the date was of the tune. And sometimes it was chronological. Sometimes he would work in one book for a while, then go to another book and then come back. Sometimes there would be the name of another fiddle player on the front of the book. So there were some transcriptions. There were um, some things he had worked out with other, other musicians, other fiddle players and friends. But the majority of these tunes were original. I started talking with Matt um, a few years ago. Look at this, Matt. And Matt remembered seeing them. I don't know that dad ever pulled out the entire collection for anybody. I've not heard anybody say that. They might see one or two, or they may have worked in one that he had had out at the time, but he would take these journals with him on the road. He would have one in his case that he took. He'd have them at home, and it was just fiddle tune after fiddle tune after fiddle tune. And the names of these tunes were corresponding with the things he did. They might be named after a friend, a person, um, a street, a town, an event. The very first tune in the very first book was called Tell You Ride. And he wrote it on the way to Tell You Ride, Colorado, which of course he used to love playing the Tell You Ride Bluegrass Festival. Mm. So it just seemed like he was basically writing his biography in fiddle tunes, which blew my mind. You know, to think, wow, that's like this way of communicating for someone who's so deeply entrenched into that music to the point that he was thinking in music. And the more we get into these tunes, you know, he was taking inspiration from, you know, the wind blowing through the trees or the cadence of somebody's voice when they were talking with somebody else across the table. He was just taking inspiration from everywhere. And you can see the progression through the books. You can tell when he was in his heavy Ed Haley phase, which lasted until the end. So that was that's the last big section of the journals. You can tell, you know, when he was experimenting with different um, ways of coming at the music, practicing different things, working with the metronome. And of course, Matt being a fiddle player, you know, quite the good fiddle player can can see more of it, um, of different things he was experimenting with. But it was from about 1983 until early 2001, right before he passed, you can kind of see how his life was going. And even with his cancer diagnosis, he would write tunes about how he was feeling in a particular day. And especially towards the end, there were there was one called Real Do Prednisone. And it was, I think, about the prednisone rush that you get when you're on the steroids. It, it was life. It was life in fiddle tunes. Looking at it like that, 
that it's this that it's this journal and it's not just uh, keeping of of these of these tunes it's mm-hmm. it's reflections on everything that was happening around mm-hmm. there what did you learn in in looking at and sort of hearing some of the tunes that that span that time i learned about what interested him and a little more of how his brain worked because i could see his attention to detail to minutia i mean just he would just fall into rabbit holes and chase them um, and just get so detailed about some things. And just, it was interesting to see what his observations were. You know, one tune that's in the book is called Cathedral Forest. And what's fascinating to me is because he wrote down where he was and he was in Northern California and he wrote, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but around the mile marker, of where he was at the time. Well, my husband and I were out there on vacation with our kids last summer and we drove it and we're looking around to see what was the inspiration of these huge trees. And it was so magnificent and so overwhelming. And then I'm thinking this tune, Cathedral Force, okay, that makes sense. The inspiration and where that's coming from. And it just taught me so much about kind of the inner workings of what he was thinking and where he was drawing that inspiration from. And it, there was also a lot of personal stuff in there writing about people. And one thing that brought me to tears when Matt was going through the book, he said, Katie, do you realize that your dad wrote you a tune? Like I had no idea. And there was a tune called Katie comes to visit and it, he wrote it. I think it was on Christmas day or maybe the day after. And I would always see him on Christmas And at one point, he wrote a tune about my visit to his house, which just was so special to me. Of course, we had to put that one in the book. Mm. But he also wrote one after my wedding to my husband. And he it was funny because the reception was at his house. And the the music that we had set up for the reception didn't work. The speaker system didn't work. And so dad, being the consummate gentleman that he was, he got my brother and my uncle, and they sat down. They did a trio. So I feel like, okay, so like John Hartford played my wedding reception. <laughs> and that, that, that was pretty... Good speakers didn't work. <laughs> exactly. That, that was pretty cool. But after the reception, there's a fiddle tune. It's mm. called The Waltz of the Wedding We Had. That one didn't make it into the book. But it's just so special to me to think, wow, he thought about that, and that was inspiring to him. And there are a lot of people that he wrote tunes about, and they didn't know until we were doing this book that they had a tune. And that was just, it was so special to be able to pull those tunes out and send them to people and say, hey, guess what? Hmm. He was thinking of you, and here it is. And how many people have a fiddle tune written for them? Hmm. I mean, that's pretty, pretty unique. Yeah, and and why with the with Kitty comes to visit? Like, why was that? Why was that as moving as it was? Was it sort of a new perspective, a new perspective mm-hmm. on him that uh, you didn't necessarily know at the time, or was it just being sort of reminded of that time? Or why was that? Why was that one touching? I think because, you know, I'm not a musician, and. Because, you know, I'm a child of the first marriage and my brother and I both, but I didn't go that same path. And so I think our relationship was strained for a while because we just didn't know each other. When he was out in California doing the Smothers Brothers, and of course my parents were still together at that point and I was born at that point. But when he kind of started that that rise out in California in um, his professional career, that's when their marriage ended and my mom moved back to Nashville. So there was, there was a lot of bonding that did not take place Mm. um, between he and I. So it took us a while to, to find our groove. I mean, a long while. And I guess I just figured he never thought about it, you know, because I wasn't musical, because I didn't share that with him. I didn't play anything, so I couldn't couldn't participate in the jams. I couldn't talk the talk. Um, and he was so very much into that. I mean, that's what he, he breathed music. He breathed, um, you know, the fiddle and the banjo and, and, and all of that. It was just hard for us connect, to connect. So to me, just to know that he did think about me just 
it's hard to describe, but it was so incredibly special. Yeah. So special. And, and, you know, you have this, I'm, I'm, we're sitting in a room right now where you have you have a a, a bunch of uh, stuff of his that you mm. say is is five percent of the overall collection, <laughs> which is, is just fascinating to think about. Um, I mean, what has it been like to get to know uh, him mm. uh, posthumously uh, in this way? You know, and I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I feel like this has been a pretty unique experience. To have the opportunity to go back, you know, when, when, when dad passed away, that was very traumatic because we had just really found our groove. Um, I had two kids and he adored my kids and he adored his grandchildren. And we were just, we were really connecting at that point, And then I lost him and it just was so unfair because we had worked so hard to try and find that spot and then now he's gone. So, and there there were several years before we took possession of the contents of his office and it was, you know, as you know, it it it's hard to reconcile the loss of a parent even when it's a good relationship, but when it's a complicated relationship, it's even harder and just there's a lot of wondering, you know, well and, and, and we tend to look at our parents on the surface. I don't think we necessarily look at our parents as people. We see them as our parents, as this person who has an obligation, a responsibility to us, and did they fulfill it or did they not? And I think in a lot of ways, we don't cut our parents enough slack, honestly. And so having the opportunity, and mind you, it's been 12 years it's taken 12 years to go through all of this and decide what to do with it. And we could have easily, and I could have easily just said, you know what, I'm not up for this. This is too much. I'm hurt. And we could have so quickly found someone to take all of this off our hands and been done. But I just felt like, and my husband felt like, and, and, and I have to give my husband credit. He, he, he steered this path for a while before I was able to come on board with it because I was still reeling mm. from from just the loss and just trying to reconcile all of that. And he kept things afloat and kept things going because he knew, he knew that 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 we were gonna need that that healing. And so over time I was able to kind of start going through things and looking through things. And some of the things that I found were painful and some of the things that I found were funny. There's stuff that I know I'm not supposed to have ever looked at that he probably <laughs> thought no one would ever see. And I've read things about my father and he was a very human person. I mean, he, he, he was flawed and wonderful and all the things that we all are. And it was, a, it was helpful for me to put that into context, but what I discovered that was so cathartic for me is that we were more alike than I ever realized. And I needed that. I needed to know that because I thought we were so distant for so long. And then the more I got to know him and his creative approach and the way he thought about things, I'm like, oh, so that's where I get that from. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's it. It's like it started making sense. Yeah. And it was just so helpful and bonding in a way and it's crazy but I feel very close to him now and I still have my moments but I'm not I'm not angry I'm not bitter I'm not um I'm glad I'm glad it happened that that it happened the way it did in terms of I, I wish he were still here honestly I I I so badly wish he were still here because I wish we could sit down and talk about all this now. And I wish that he could see my kids now and just, and, 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 and all his grandchildren, um, and just see, you know, where things are at and, and be able to enjoy this time with them now, because there's so much we would all relate to, but I'm glad that at least I had 
all of this stuff. And oh my goodness, there's so much stuff, <laughs> so much stuff, but I'm glad I had it to, to reconcile with. Yeah. Do you, um, I mean, get, let's go back just, uh, a handful of years. <laughs> you, how, um, to someone who doesn't know who John Hartford is, mm-hmm. uh, how do you describe who he is and, and who he was? I guess it depends on who the person is. You know, I glean a lot of that from what other people tell me, which is going to sound strange at first. It's like, well, shouldn't you know? It's like, well, I know him from a different perspective. I am learning from a lot of musicians, especially musicians of a younger generation, that he was very inspirational to them and to their music and just his creative approach, his willingness to not only go outside the box, but slam the lid closed and dance on top of it. You know, he is so far not constrained by the box. And I love that about him. But if I'm being my snarky self, (laughs) I would tell you that he's an obsessive creative. Mm -hmm. He probably didn't sleep real well at night, mind going 90 miles an hour, constant idea generation, constant wondering, constant thinking, how would this go here and how would that work there and what would this sound like? He practiced all the time. He played all the time. Anybody who knew him would tell you he was constantly going. He was just endless energy, always looking for that new creative avenue to pursue, to extend what he was working on, to research more, to find out more about the things that he was interested in. He was very obsessive. And, you know, it's a good thing he was obsessive about productive things. <laughs> it turned out really well. Had, had it not been a productive subject matter, we might be having a different conversation. <laughs> well, Matt told me this story where uh, I, I forget where the where where the party was or where the event was, but mm-hmm. you know he showed up he showed up to to your dad's house and and uh, and you know he was basically like you ready to go and he's and and and, and your dad's response was um, uh, you know if we play our cards right we're going to get to play music all day and all night. That's right. <laughs> I think they were headed to Larry Perkins' house. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. And it wasn't about the specifics of the social interaction. It was like it was like we will be able to fully occupy this time yep. playing music yep. all waking hours. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When I learned about uh, who John Harper was and what he was doing and what he was making, mm-hmm. um, you know, it seemed from a from strictly from an artist perspective, mm-hmm. it seemed like the best of what American popular music was suggesting was possible, right? Was Mm -hmm. sort of an obsessive nature, Mm -hmm. a, a, um, uh, totally outside the box nature. I Mm -hmm. mean, I mean, Matt today pointed out that a gentleman in my mind, uh, uh, breaks sort of every convention of a popular song Mm -hmm. at the time. Did he know that, you know, or was, did that even play into his, his consciousness? I, I'm not sure actually. I mean, he may have been aware of some of it, but He was raised by an artist. My grandmother was a painter. She was a very can-do person. Um, His father was a doctor and research scientist. In fact, my grandfather was part of the, I believe, flu vaccine trials back with, um, I want to say Albert Sabin, Hmm. uh, years ago. Very smart, methodical man, sweet, sweet gentleman. And my grandmother was very creative. She made the tapestry that went behind the altar when they got married. She needed a fireplace screen, so she took a class and learned how to make one and made it. And she painted in oils and watercolors. She knitted. She read books for the blind. I mean, it, she was a very, very um, creative person. He just, He came from very heady creative stock and all up through the family tree. Tennessee Williams is a, is a cousin of my grandfather's, Mm. you know, so there, there was a lot of that. So I think probably he was allowed very early on to, to rabbit trail and to figure out his own pursuits. I don't think his parents told him you have to be this. 
They might have preferred it, but <laughs> I don't think they told him that he did. And he and his sisters, all three of them, were allowed to pursue what their interests were. So I think he learned early on. And, of course, growing up um, in the 50s and 60s and or early 60s, being in, in college, he went to art school at uh, Wash U in St. Louis and was very inspired by his teachers there. I don't know that, you know, if you think about it, a lot of our hesitance to do things is based on, you know, personal trauma or some sort of pain in our past where we're afraid to go somewhere because someone's told us that we can't or told us that we shouldn't. I'm not sure he heard a whole lot of that. <laughs> there Now, there was one teacher in college, I believe it was in college, in art school, and I may not be getting this right. My mom tells the story that he did have a teacher somewhere because I guess he was fidgety and always, you know, probably getting in trouble at school. I think my grandmother was called to the school office quite a bit. And his teacher told him, you know, he'd be lucky to earn a living selling pencils mm. on the street, mm -hmm. which I think that was hurtful. But at the same time, he had so much support at home. I think he probably was able to get past a lot of that. And he just did his own thing. Mm -hmm. He he was always, you know, kind of trying to go ahead of the curve to see what the next thing was. But I think that was just his personality. Yeah. So sometimes it seems like people use that, you know, where mm -hmm. it's like, where I heard this interview with Jimmy Kimmel a long time ago, mm -hmm. and I mean, like he's doing fine, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. <laughs> everything seems so worked out for uh -huh. Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah. And and so he was asked what motivates him, and you know, he talked about the positive things. And then he said he talked about one boss in radio when he was nineteen, who said mm -hmm. he'd never amount to anything, and he's like, I think about that guy every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then sometimes those people in our lives, they're they're meant to be stumbling stones, but instead they inspire us. We mm -hmm. just use them to jump off instead. Right. Of of, you know, stopping us. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. And 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 so I mean, looking back at at um your father's legacy, I mean, and I know that you see it mm -hmm. separately from sort of how people see it on the outside. Mm -hmm. But how do you think, you know, how do you think he's he's remembered? Like what is he remembered? for and and how does that line up with again i'm looking at all these boxes and stuff uh -huh. you have here how does that line up with the person who you've come to know uh, in this archive um i i think there's some consistency there i do um uh, it depends on once again how the person knew him i would say the people who knew him well while he was alive you know around his age a little bit younger they knew him as a very gracious um peer someone who loved to play was always ready to go ready to play ready to go do a show very generous he would stay around after a show and sign all the autographs talk to all the people he would engage with people i'm always getting facebook messages and emails of people who will say oh i saw him at this show in 1978 and he was so kind to us and we visited him later he remembered our names things like that and which I love that. I love that people remember him that way because that makes me feel good that mm. he sought to be, at least in the later years, um, <laughs> sought to be such a gracious person. I mean, I think we all go through our moments, but I think he really sought to give back and to be generous to others. A lot of the, like the bands that will name his him as an influence now, the younger bands who probably didn't even know about him when he was alive, but as they grew and started to get into music, maybe he had already passed on at that point or, and, and they see him as an inspiration. Now I think they see someone who kind of had one foot in the traditional and one foot in the future that he was willing to take these traditional elements, which he loved and studied um, intently but then he used that as a jumping off point to explore and go find new things and see what he could build on and, and do other things. So he was just, he revered, you know, Bill Monroe and Benny Martin and Earl Scruggs and Lester Flatt and all those wonderful greats that began the genre. But yet he was also listening to Flim and the BBs, jazz. Um, in fact, when we donated all of his vinyl collection to the Center for Popular Music. I kept one album. It was Michael Jackson's Thriller. 
Yeah, maybe we're not supposed to talk about Michael Jackson right uh, now, but well, it's he a great didn't album. Know that. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. But um, but I had to keep oh that album God. because it, it was in his collection. That's and I unreal. love that. I love yeah. that because he was he was listening to everything. If it was interesting, um, he was listening to it. Even mm. church music, I mean, whatever. If it was interesting and it was making sense and he could grow from it, he was listening to it. And he was incorporating all of that into what he was doing. And I think people see that, the, the groups now see that, and it kind of, it's permission to to just blow the lid off the joint and explore the boundaries and the new things. And just, you know, the way he would use words as, like he, he would use his voice as an instrument. You know, it, the words weren't always, you know, because sometimes you can build a song around the instrumentation or you can build it around the words. And sometimes he would use the words as instrumentation and, you know, it, just all these crazy things that he would do. He just felt free to do that. And I love that he's kind of given permission to others to go do the same thing and look at all the cool music we're getting yeah. now. And I'm not saying it's all attributed to him, but I'm I'm very proud of the fact, if I could say that, that he helped inspire that because I think we're just getting such amazing music acoustic music now it's just it blows my mind yeah. what people are coming up with what are, what are uh, what have been some of the things you've been most surprised to hear um from people who had uh, encounters with your father um well this was kind of funny actually <laughs> a lot of people know that he was a riverboat pilot and someone wrote to us oh no no, they didn't write. I think we saw them at a festival, someone who was also a riverboat pilot, and they said, yeah, he was a pilot, but they weren't sure that he was, like, the greatest pilot. <laughs> <laughs> they talked about how, I guess, when he was early on learning, he, he actually ran a boat into a sandbar <laughs> or under, under some branches, and they had to get someone to come get it out. And what's funny is we were going through the papers and stuff to get ready for this latest donation. We actually found the incident report really? <laughs> for that. <laughs> I thought that was hysterical because, you know, everybody talks about, Oh, he was this amazing, this and amazing that and my theory is that nobody can do it all. Well, right. like, right. you know, we only get so many chips and you can put them in whatever pile you want, <laughs> or you can spread them out, but nobody can do everything well. And so I think he's perceived as doing all these things and doing them well. Mm. And some things he did really well, but, and I'm not saying he was a bad pilot, but I'm just saying, just like anybody else, he was human, mm -hmm. and and he had had his issues. And I think there's a song on heading down to the mystery below that he talks about. What is it? Um, Kentucky Pool, I believe, is the name of the song. Kentucky Pool made a fool out of me. And anyway, I think that That's was just it? yeah. <laughs> yeah, he he wasn't the John Hartford of being a riverboat pilot. <laughs> <laughs> But he tried it. But right. the fact that he was willing to go do it, you yeah. know, it's like he wanted it. So he went to go do it. And I know Matt talks about as he was going through the journals, you know, of course, 68 fiddle journals, thousands of fiddle tunes. And it's like, oh, my gosh, John Hartford did this. Well, as Matt's going through this, he said, you know, not every one of these was a winner. Mm. You know, some of these are like, OK, there are a lot of hornpipes here. OK, it's enough <laughs> of the hornpipes. And but you just get the sense of the person and the fact. I mean, a journal is not supposed to be perfect. Mm -hmm. The journal is the place where you try. And nowadays we've got social media and everybody's putting their best foot forward because you can you can do 10 takes and give it the perfect thing. Or you can go into the studio and do it however many times digitally and put the most perfect thing out. No mistakes. And I think that's so sad. And I think dad would think that was sad too, that there was no room for error. And in a way, error is freeing. You know, if we can just become accepting of the fact that things aren't going to be perfect and that it is going to take several tries to get something right. And that just, you know, and that it took John Hartford several years of working on fiddle tunes to get a groove and get a flow. And not everything he did was wonderful. Not every song he wrote was a hit and that's great and that's okay and he's human and he, but he just kept pounding the door and going after it and going after it and it's inspiring to me as a creative and I would hope for other creatives it's not about being perfect or getting it right it's about every day sitting down and committing to the practice and continuing to try and continuing to try and eventually you're going to come up with something mm -hmm. but you're going to have to mine for a while to get there but that's all right 
Yeah. It's all right. Yeah, that's a fantastic lesson. Yeah. It's a fabulous lesson. Yeah. What do you want people to know about your father? And, and, and what do you think that people should know that if they think they know who he is based on whatever their input is mm -hmm. or however they've learned about him, mm -hmm. that you think maybe they've missed? You know, I guess if, if I were to try and speak for him and say, you know, here's, here's the takeaway that maybe I think he would want people to get that I would hope that people got, um, one is to be real, to be real with how you're feeling, what you're thinking, what your creativity is, to find what you do. Don't try to be somebody else. Now, it's okay to look at the way someone's doing something and try it on. You know, just like in art school, you know, they have you copy the masters, not so that you can make a copy of the masters, but so that by copying them, you can learn their techniques, then take those techniques and apply them through your own filter. And I think he would want people to feel inspired to figure out who they are and what they do, just like he took his love of bluegrass, his love of the banjo and the fiddle and all this old music, but then also his love of the riverboats and that Victorian ethic. And But then the jam band and the jazz, he would take all of that and he made his own unique thing out of it. And that's him, and that's great. And that he would want people not necessarily to copy that, but to take that same technique and find themselves. What is it that interests them? What is it that drives them? Push that creative envelope and explore and find new things and gain new ground mm -hmm. and push the music further. At the same time, recognizing and appreciating what's come before and then continue to push forward yeah. into new things. That's, that's excellent. Well, I, I really, I really appreciate your time. Thanks well, thank so much you for, for talking. Coming. I appreciate you considering him and all of this. That, that means a lot. Excellent. Well, thank so, you so much. I right. appreciate it. Thanks Alex. All right, everybody, you made it. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Nashville Demystified. Thanks to Jesse LaFontaine for all things related to sound post-production and uh you should know that every episode has a show specific illustration provided by my longtime friend tim burns they are pretty amazing as far as i'm concerned uh so check out the site to see them or any of our social channels next week we talk with the incredible Brittany haas about her initial move to nashville and we talk with councilman anthony davis about civics in beer in future episodes, we're going to talk about hee-haw, about comedy, about black history, black music, about development, about gentrification, uh, and other city icons. If you have any suggestions regarding topics that you want us to cover, please get in touch uh, in any of the ways that the internet makes possible. National Demystified is presented by Knack Factory, and we own this town. Thanks again for listening. Cross that bridge again, I'll pick her up. Be